warm you up and switch you back from a scattering to second quantization of medieval body physics by asking a couple of questions. So you don't need to answer now, you can think, but it would be kind of a good test about whether you understand the second quantization. I also did it to my students when I asked them, do you know second quantization? They said, yes, yes, yes. Then I will still give a, a course a bit longer than I gave yesterday. Uh, and then uh, I put some question on the test. The result was very broad distributed. Yeah? So, okay, so, but check yourself. Yeah? Number one is suppose we want to study n particle system in a one dimensional harmonic confinement. That means um, uh, u of, of x, yeah, one dimensional, is m omega squared x squared over 2. To give you a hint, or maybe confuse you, better say, yeah, I just remind you that in a harmonic normal quantum mechanics, in a harmonic oscillator, we introduce also creation and relation operator, right? But let me write with the index h that reminds harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics. Yeah? which is uh, 1 over square root of 2, and if I remember correctly, it's x over L0. Um, uh, let me put dagger, then I have to write plus i L0 over h bar p, and where uh, L0 uh, is just a harmonic oscillator length size of the ground state. Now, and the corresponding annihilation operator, which is exactly the same with a minus sign here, yeah? where p is uh, momentum operator minus i h bar uh, derivative yeah, over x. No? So the question number, so question A, how many creation annihilation, let me write it like this because yeah, you understand, operators do we need to describe n particle system. So how many should we introduce? No? And uh, number B, do A H dagger and A H relevant for many body systems? When you describe n particle system. Do these operators sort of convenient or not? No. This is question number one. Question number two, more technical. No? In, in the coordinate representation, write the many body wave functions of the following state. Which I will give you in a, in as a, as a um, state in a Fox space. Yeah? So you have to translate them back as a wave function which depends on position. Yeah? So the state number one is a vacuum state. So the state with all zero occupation numbers. So it's nothing to do with the harmonic oscillator. So if we have some general many body systems, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Yeah, like like yesterday. Uh, question number two is uh, a state where I have just one particle in the sort of uh, new i single particle state. Yeah, and uh, it's convenient to call it. One i, yeah. Number c, if I take the state, if all particles sit in one quantum state, I choose it the first one, and all the rest is zero. Number d is where I have n particles, or let's say n minus one particles in one state, and somewhere. One particle, again, we can have, let's say, new i state. So that was new 
one, and that is new i. And that is again new one. Yeah? It's just for definiteness in some state. Yeah? And finally, the most probably interesting question, because these are formal exercises. Yeah? Just slightly think, and then you can remember the lectures, open the book, then you can write the answer. But now comes an interesting question. So suppose I have my vacuum state, and I apply operator psi dagger at R0. Yeah. Write the wave function for this state. So I start with empty state vacuum state, and I create a particle by applying not some A dagger operator. Yeah, when I put it, I know in some state like this, yeah, uh, like this. But I apply psi dagger at position R0. So there are a set of all these A daggers. Yeah? When you answer this question, you get the right answer. You will understand why people say that psi dagger R or zero create creates a particle at R zero. This will explain yeah, because clear psi can psi dagger contains creation operators, so it should create particle, but why at a zero? So the wave function that you write will tell you exactly this. <coughs> yeah. So this is warm-up. Or test, if you like. Yeah. We are not going to do it now. If you think, if you have questions, you can come and ask. Yeah. And maybe if I not forget, we will have time, we can go through quickly to this. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So now let's continue, let's back to the uh, Bose system. So what we as a result of the struggling <laughs> from the last lecture with all these operators, we actually arrived to the following Hamiltonian of bosonic system. Uh, uh, let me consider, uh, for simplicity, of course, the most simplest case in the box. Yeah? We have n bosons identical in a box. And the Hamiltonian, if I use, of course, Box is very large, number of particles also very large. Of course, I fix the density. So the Hamiltonian looks like this. It's a kinetic energy. <coughs> so I label my state, okay, then I have my phi p of r, which are one over square root of volume e to the i over h bar p r. I walk in this language. Yeah? So my Hamiltonian is epsilon p, a p dagger a p, that was my kinetic term with epsilon p is, of course, p squared over 2m. And then I have an interaction term where I already model my potential by a constant. I think next lecture we will discuss this. And I said be careful with these things huh? because it does not... Okay. And then sum over p1, p2, and q. And then you have a scattering term because the amplitude is a constant. I took it out. So then to make it even simpler... I have a1 p1 plus q dagger a p2 minus q dagger a p2 a p1. Yeah? So two particles in the state p1, p2 annihilated, p1 plus q and p2 minus q are created. Yeah? So it's typical scattering, S wave scattering, because you see the amplitude of this process is constant. Does not depend on, on direction. Yeah? So, of course, and we want to look at what are the properties of this Hamiltonian, uh, let's say, low energy sector. Because we, are, again, as I said, we're at low temperatures, so we probe the ground state and excitations around it. So what we're interested to find what's the ground state, what are excitations in the system. And, of course, the, the important point is, is to see whether the system exhibits this phenomenon of BC. Yeah? BC. Uh, uh, physically, that means microscopic occupation. I just write it down once. Ma Why micro? Macro. So n eta, meaning all the order of the total number for s for some state r uh, uh, new i. Yeah, that means microscopic occupation of a single quantum state. That means BC. Yeah. 
no? We have macroscopic number of particles in a single quantum. Um, of course, what I said in a gas, we're in a quantum gas regime. This interaction is somehow small. We will walk more detailed criteria. I have already. We have already detailed criteria. What means small? So the size of scattering length is much smaller than the interparticle separation. And then uh, it's tempting to consider this term as a perturbation. Yeah. And this means if you are in a perturbation theory, first what you have to do, you have to study the unperturbed Hamiltonian and then find the whole set and then you apply standard perturbation theory, etc. Yeah. So therefore, first what we will do is we will study this Hamiltonian yeah, and of course, yeah. And then we take into account this one, but uh, I'll tell you, although this is small and it's tempting to use perturbation theory, perturbation, direct perturbation theory will not give you a result because you immediately face with the divergent integrals at smaller k, small, small moment. Not a large, but small. With this model, also large moment to divergent, but this we know how to treat. But small p, we don't know. It's infrared problem. Something went wrong on a large distance. Yeah? So therefore, you will see that the solution will be highly non-perturbing. So the solution of this Hamiltonian, as you know from lecture of Thierry, will be verified, at least for small p, from the solution from the spectrum of this Hamiltonian. Yeah? So let me now, of course, when we're looking at this, we have n particles. So that means that if we have the operator number of particles, we are walking in a sense uh, this sector of the Hilbert space where this is n and a fixed. And uh, uh, that's, that's what actually what we have to do, solve this Hamiltonian under constraint that number of particles fixed. So in a particular sector, this Hn of our Hilbert Fox space. But this is, of course, you know from statistical mechanics, this is a hard problem. This constraint makes life different. So what you do, you go from microcanonical to canonical ensemble. So you go from Hamiltonian H, you go to Hamiltonian H prime, which is H minus mu N. So you introduce a chemical potential and number of particles is fixed on average. So you require that what the state you find, whatever state you find, average value of N is N. Of course, now this mu you attach to both reservoir of particle, particle go back and forth, n is not fixed anymore, but on average, we fix it by n, and you know if n is large, it's one of the square root of n fluctuations. Even for million particle, it's 0.1% uh, beyond any error bar in the current experiments in, in cold atmosphere, for example. Yeah? And this, of course, this determine you mu as a function of n and t. Yeah? This is actually condition to find mu. Hmm? So <coughs> as I said, let's start with a simple exercise just to know what is these things. Ideal both a gas, it's also a very nice object. And then we study it and I show it actually not super fluid. Although it has BC, it has long range order, etc. But not super fluid. So let's do it step by step. Let's start BC in ideal both a gas. <coughs> so now we have this Hamiltonian H prime. As I said, we go to canonical ensemble, which is convenient. It is sum over P. Uh, if you look at this, this and this, the Hamiltonian looks like epsilon P minus mu uh, AP dagger AP. That's the Hamiltonian we have to look. And of course, the N and this uh, average A sum over P average AP dagger AP is N fixed. Yeah, so how to solve this problem? Yeah. Uh, about BC, statement. So what does it mean? We are looking for whether it's BC or not. In ideal Bose system, in any ideal Bose system, doesn't matter, in a box, trapped, three-dimensional, five-dimensional, one-dimensional, if it has at least two energy levels. One is trivial, yeah, because you put everything in and that's there. If you have at least two energy levels, system exhibits BC at t equals zero. So at any ideal, ideal crucial, t equals zero, BC. Very clear, 
explanation thermodynamically, t equals zero, we are in a ground state. Yeah? Ground state for ideal bosons, bosons can be on the same quantum state, yeah, whatever, there is no limit, so they are not Fermi. At ground state, all particles sit in the lowest single particle state. That means microscopic occupation of the ground state, of a single particle ground state. No? So the question, of course, if you think about ideal physics, whether you have such phenomena at non-zero temperature. At zero temperature, they all have. Even in one dimensional case, ideal bosons, both are condensed. Yeah? Question is whether so T C larger than zero, that's the answer. We, the question we have to ask. Yeah? And for the ideal boss, I guess you know, of course, the answer very well. Let me remind you. Maybe put these things slightly what more, not a canonical, which is now in the textbooks, but what more in the origin in the, in the Einstein paper words. Yeah, we know. If we look at this condition, try to write it down with all your knowledge of statistical mechanics. Yeah? So we write the M sum over P, AP dagger AP. <coughs> but this, we know, it's a number of bosons in the mode with momentum P. And because all the modes are independent, uh, so we know that these numbers is given by simply Bose-Einstein distribution at a given temperature. So it's 1 over E epsilon p minus mu over t minus 1. Yeah. Statistical mechanics. All modes are independent. Yeah, they populated independently. So now let me write, rewrite this condition. Uh, it's, of course, convenient to go now, go to continuum notations, assuming that v is very large, n is very large, etc. So sum over p is translated is volume integral over dp over 2 pi h bar cube. That was my continuum version of sum over p. Ah, sorry. Um, no, right. Sorry. That's, that's okay. Yeah. So that was uh, continuum. And now I have 1 over e to the epsilon p minus mu over t minus 1. So I have to fulfill this condition. Yeah. Of course, the first, yeah, we know that this is NP average. And if you look at this expression, you immediately see that for ideal Bose, I guess mu has to be, is not allowed to be positive. So mu in this case, less or equal zero. Positive you cannot have, then otherwise you will get negative occupation numbers, divergences, etc. So some stu physically stupid result. Yeah? So mu is always negative, so that's why I can write, for example, right here, plus and modulus mu, yeah? then I'm safe. Canonically now, what people do in textbook, most textbooks, let's have same number of particles, volume, or you can rewrite it, of course, in a more, uh, so to say, easy way, n over v, which is concentration, is just this integral. Yeah? So whatever, whatever you like. And canonically in the textbooks, you fix n and you start decreasing t and see what happens. Yeah? And you find out that something wrong goes wrong with this expression below some point. Originally, Einstein did it a different way. He fixes t. The question was, you have a buff, bosonic buff at a given temperature. The question was, how many particles you can put there? Yeah, you have a volume V at a temperature t. The question was, how many particles you can put there? Yeah. Uh, clear. <coughs> yeah. So, so the question was: We now fix t and increase n, yeah? and see whether we can find the only then parameter which is left in the integral is modulus mu. Yeah? And the question is: For a given n, whether we can find mu, yeah? which satisfy this condition? Yeah? And of course, you see that if I increasing n. I have to decrease modulus mu, yeah? because the smaller modulus mu is, the smaller exponent, the smaller denominator, the larger the fraction, therefore the larger the integral. Yeah? 
Yeah, and then you, you put more, then you make modulus mu less. But then at some point, because it's modulus, it cannot be less than zero. So mu equals zero, it's so to say the border. Yeah. So therefore, well let's see what is this NC which corresponds to mu equals zero. It's V integral ZP over two pi h bar cube, one over E epsilon P over T minus one. This is kind of, we still can handle by handling mu, yeah? But that's the border. And unfortunately, fortunately, in 3D, integral converges. Yeah? So this integral finite in 3D. I, it's easy to see because, uh, of course, the large P is no problem because epsilon P is P squared. This is exponent. It kills you very fast whenever you exceed. Ah, sorry, I, I choose the K Boltzmann one. You know? Theories has tendency to put all the constants to one, but uh, I, I put only this one to one. So H bar is there. Uh, light velocity, I guess we don't need. But and uh, so K Boltzmann is one. So I measure temperature in units of energy or energy in units of temperature. But anyway, you measure energy in a very strange unit. Frequencies or, or whatever, electron volts, exponential units. So why not in Kelvin? Or so it's fine, it's easy to see because large P is never a problem, whatever dimensions is, because exponent guarantees the convergence of the integral. Small P is always a problem because this goes to zero for because for small P, you can approximate this for small P, P squared much less than MT. Yeah? So this goes like uh, DP, and here, of course, we have P squared DP, d omega, yeah, the, the, the solid angle, 2 pi h bar cube. And then this, you expand exponent, this is small. Exponent is one plus these things, one cancels, you have simply these things, you have t over epsilon p. And in three dimensions, epsilon p is actually p squared over 2m, it's always. So you see in three dimensions you have p squared here, which is single r, canceled by p squared in the measure. And you have a nice integral, yeah? So that's why it converges and finite in 3D. In 2D, this is diverges, yeah? Because I have one P left, and I end up with integral dP divided by P, which is logarithmically divergent, yeah? So in 2D, I never have mu equals zero, unless I have T equals zero, yeah? In 1D, it's even worse, yeah? Because I don't have P squared. Yeah, so I have dp divided by p squared. So therefore, in 1D, mu is also never zero. So, you, so that means you can always, in 2D, in 1D, you can always, so this actually is infinite. So you can put as many particles as you want. But in 3D, it's not the case. This is a critical number which you can put. Yeah, and um, this integral, of course, you can easily, well, easily, depending on your skills, you can calculate, so you get 4 pi as an angular integral, 2 pi h bar cube. Then you can, of course, go to dimensional units. P equals square root of 2 mt times x. Yeah, to have here x squared simply. Then uh, what you get from this d3p, you get 2 mt to the power 3 half. And then you're dealing with the integral 0 infinity dx x squared divided by e to the x squared minus 1. Yeah. And this integral you can calculate. I, I don't want to spend time on this, but this integral, uh, I just give you the answer. So the integral is, it would be square root of p divided by 4, this is Gaussian part, and then zeta function of 3, and zeta on s, it's the Riemann zeta function. Like this. For those who are interested, I can show this is simple uh, things, but, but this is the answer. Yeah? So in total, what you get, <coughs> uh, you get uh, um, 
just take my because I don't want to spend time on I think I have it somewhere hopefully yes it is here okay. so what you have you have uh, if you look at this uh, you will have that this NC as a function of temperature is given by Um, this expression zeta on 3 and then m t divided by 2 pi h bar squared I hope I didn't make any any sort of mistakes yeah in in uh, in collecting all these factors so you see for a given t uh, you maximally you can put there naively uh, only this number of particles and that was I guess the title of the Einstein paper I could and the volume, right. Yes, thank you. Uh, the title was something like that the limiting capacity of this Bose bath, etc., etc. So, of course, the question was, but, okay, that my things, it stays here, I press one more particle, and press the second one, yeah? yeah. What happened, and of course, uh, that was the Einstein who... Uh, answer the question that actually these particles extra goes to the uh, ground state of a single particle lowest single particle state yeah so they start populating not the thermal cloud yeah controlled by T with mu equals zero but it goes to the lowest energy state forming the condensate yes Oh yes, right, 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 right. Yes, 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 yes. Because of x squared, right? Mm -hmm. Three half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. This formula you can actually convert to what you know, what is familiar for you. Yeah. So uh, uh, anyway. Uh, uh, you can, as I said, you can think differently, and you can, let's say, fix n and see whether you can fix this condition by adjusting mu when you decrease the temperature. And then you find out that actually thing goes wrong at when T becomes below Tc, which you can extract from this equation, that, that similar things, yeah? which is 331 uh, h bar squared over m so this is a number I remember, I don't want to, yeah. And I'm not sure that the coefficients here are exactly right, yeah, of this type, yeah. So you see this n over volume, it's n, the density, and you, if invert the power, it will be 2,000. And then you arrange this, all these numbers like this, yeah. Remember this, Tc, that's exactly what De Broglie wavelength, thermal, becomes comparable to the antiparticle separation. That's exactly where quantum effects enters the game. Yeah? And that's exactly what happens, that if some strange things happens, particles are occupying a lowest energy state. So that means uh, below Tc, we have mu equals zero, ideal guess, but now the balance of the number of particles is like this, total number is a number on the lowest energy state, single particle state. In our case, this is p equals zero state, plus the integral, plus the contribution of the thermal cloud. But now here, mu is zero. That's how you balance. Hmm? And if you do some simple rescaling, <coughs> you will find out that this integral, so I have to rescale, I introduce here Tc and Tc, and then I rescale my P, such that I come exactly to, okay. So you know the answer. So it's N0 on T, and this integral you can easily calculate. Now this really, you don't need, you don't simply have to compare things. It's N and T over Tc to the power of 3 half. 
Ja. Ah, oh, no, mathematically. Mathem yes, yes. <coughs> because the integral does not feel, the integral does not feel uh, the value of the integrand at a given point. It's never. It's the, the arrow comes when you replace sum to the integral. Yeah? Because the integral does not sensitive to the value of the integrand even at the measure, at the set of points measure zero, and a single point is measure zero. Uh, this is would be an interesting question I, was, uh, I will uh, present you afterwards. Yeah. So for this, you really have to take a box, take a discrete spectrum, and see what happens with the occupation of this, deal with the sum. Yeah. I give some answers uh, how, how it actually happens, but, but uh, a, a bit later, a bit later. Yeah. So from here, we immediately conclude that at finite temperature below Tc, this number of particles, which is m, 1 minus T over Tc, 3 half, sits in the ground state. Yeah? This is, of course, known phenomenon. You know B and C. That's why I do it so quickly. Yeah? So they occupying just a single state, and at T equals 0, as we already know, all of them are there. So this is, of course, not a surprise. This is just ideal bosonic. I said everything that I want to say before I, yeah. Okay, before discussing this condensed state, BEC condensed state, yeah, let me give you some, some results for other systems, yeah, to have, to give you some flavor of how things are going in other dimensions, in other systems, etc., etc. So, um, first of all, you can do some calculations uh, and find out, uh, okay, let's say in a free space, that's exactly our box, because then I will discuss harmonic confining case. Free box. You can actually calculate how we know that mu in a three-dimensional case, zero below Tc and non-zero above Tc, so if I now have T larger than Tc, so 3D case, T larger than Tc, how mu approaches zero when T approaches Tc. You can do calculations, in this case mu, modulus mu, as a function of T, behaves like, so here's some numerical coefficients, you can calculate it, but okay, the, the scale is Tc, but then T minus Tc over Tc square. So mu quadratically approaches zero, so if I plot modulus mu as a function of t, this is tc, so here I have zero, and then I quadratically start deviating. That's how it goes. No? As I said, in 2D and 3D, uh, sorry, in 2D and 1D, we don't have bc, so it we, we never have mu equals zero. It doesn't mean that the number of particles sitting on this low energy states are small. No, no but we don't have of order n. I will give example a bit later, just to demonstrate what does it mean. Huh? So now if I have 2D, as I said, there is no BC. That means modulus mu s behaves like T times exponent minus some T0 divided by T. So you see, it's never zero, but it quickly goes to zero, where T0 is of course some characteristic energy scale, which is of course you can guess it is something like h bar squared over m times the two-dimensional density. It's of that kind because others simply do not exist. Any, any, yeah. And in one d, just for completeness, huh? mu modulus mu behaves like t squared over t zero with T0 now one-dimensional 
uh, in energy scale in one dimensions, which is h bar squared over m n one square. So this is what happens in one, two, and three dimensional case. So here we have no BC and the chemical potential never zero. You can always balance the number of particles in a thermal cloud. You don't need to macroscopically occupy a single state. Yeah, but in 3D you have to. Yeah? No other way. So now, um, let me skip it. Okay, let me now discuss is the more details. Yeah? I said here mu is zero. Yeah? So if I have now a big box P and many particles N, 10 to the 23, let's say, 10, whatever. Yeah? In this room, I guess, would be something like 10 to the 26 or something like that. Yeah? Is it really zero in this situation? No, in a real limit, N infinity, V infinity, but in a very large, is it really zero mathematically? Or it is some very, very small number? Yeah? The answer is, to answer this question, you really have to look what happens in the box. Yeah? Uh, you take a large box, L cross L cross L for simplicity, just a cube. You put a, a, a zero boundary condition. Just to know all the wave function, uh, more important, of course, for our thermodynamics, eigen energy. Then, of course, you know that there is the, 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 the lowest energy, lowest single particle energy, epsilon zero, is h bar squared over 2m pi over l squared, and then you have uh, 3. Yeah? Because you have x direction, sine as pi over x, y direction, and a z direction, so 3 is its number of directions. Yeah? And then you have first excited state, yeah, where uh, you have sinus 2 pi over Lx, at least in one direction. So it's three times degenerate in this. Yeah? So what you would have, uh, h bar squared over 2m pi over L uh, squared, and now you have uh, 6. Yeah? So this was 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. And this has to be 2 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. Yeah? So you see the energy difference scales like 1 over L squared. So 1 of the volume to 2 thirds goes to 0 as it should be. So now if you look how this condition can be fulfilled in the box. Yeah? And of course I would be interested, I present you the results for the temperatures, which is much less or at least less than TC, probably much less than TC, it's, it's better in this case, but much larger than the delta epsilon. And the delta epsilon is of course the level spacing h bar squared over m pi over l squared. Yeah? So I'm not interested in these microscopically small temperatures I'm interested in the real temperatures, which are much, much larger than the level space in your system, such that the system is practically continuous, but much less than TC, so have a simpler formula. So you can write down a more general case, but it was simpler. And then, of course, because we have a ground state which is non-zero here, although it goes to zero, mu, I give you the answer. Mu at this temperature is actually, of course, epsilon zero. Huh? Yeah. Uh, which we would have, of course, for t equals zero, yeah, because it's the lowest it's the offset of energy. You can change the energy zero to this point, then it would be zero here. But then minus t over n. Of course, you see when temperature goes to zero, it goes to zero. That's fine. We know that. Yeah? At t equals zero, everything should sit there. But at this temperature, you see, one over n. It's microscopically small quantity. Strictly speaking, non-zero. Yeah? Uh, you can also evaluate occupation numbers of the this state, and let me calculate, give you the answer for the first excited state. Yeah? This state, up to correction t over t c to some power cube, yeah, would be n times some constant. Yeah, but of the order n, these things would be 
n to the power 2 thought t over tc. We know then tc goes to 0, it should go to 0, yeah? because everything should sit in zero epsilon 0 state. But for t non zero, where this fraction, let's say 0.1, 1 20th, yeah, it is non zero and it's actually very large. 10 to the n to the power 2 thought. Yeah? Unless this is microscopically small. Yeah? It's become a uh, micro, uh, so, uh, s yeah. yeah. You see, it's not populations of all other states. Uh, it's also very large, much larger than one. But if I take the ratio, it goes to zero with n increasing. Yeah. Indeed, one level macroscopically populated of the order n, the others, first excited, second, etc., etc., they are largely populate, but not of the order n, n to some power less than one. This is, of course, will be exactly the same in the non-ideal case, and that's exactly the reason why these mean field solutions, mean field equations, Grosz-Kitaevsky, is so successful, because we know and we will use it if the occupation numbers are large, you can forget about this in the commutator of the creation annihilation operators. Yeah. For this mode, you can forget about one because matrix elements are square root of n plus one for one and square root of n for another. But when n is very large, you can forget about one. That means operators that describes this highly populated mode not, n not, not only the ground state, but also lower mode, they are classical fields. That's why that is classical field description, gross Pitaevsky, etc. It's so, so successful. Okay, let's go further. Ah, sorry, I forgot. Now, if you have harmonic confinement, what happens? Of course, if you have harmonic confinement, because many experiments is done in the harmonic confinement, so here, of course, we have large but fixed number of states, uh, particles. So therefore, we don't have this thermodynamic limit actually. So I think something goes wrong. Oh yeah, this is make the whole things collapsing again. Uh, strictly speaking, we don't have phase transition. So in a, in a, in ide in the ideal gas in a, in a thermodynamic link, we do have phase transition with these discontinuities, yeah, zero and then quadratic. So second derivative is already diverged, uh, sort of discontinued. Yeah. In a finite system, we never has. We have kind of crossover. Yeah. In principle, you can define uh, what do you mean by sort of critical temperature, crossover temperature. A precise definition. Dep Precise value depends on your convention. How would you define it? Yeah? How many? 90% or you know, 5% or whatever. Yeah? But important because the spectrum, uh, uh, and of course you are interested in the case saying that you have B, C, meaning that this characteristic temperature where you start seeing the growing population of a given state, single particle state, is of course much larger than H bar omega. Yeah? Because otherwise, it makes no sense. No? No? And then, of course, situation is, is so here in the harmonic confinement different because I, I had no time. I guess you had this, uh, so to say, in, in all your statistical course. Uh, situation is different rather than three particle case because the density of state is different. No? Spectrum are different for harmonic oscillator and a three particle case. And therefore, it's these sums convergent better in low dimensions because simply you have more state with the lower energy rather than in a, in a, in a for the three particles. Yeah? So in this case, uh, uh, you have um, in, in 3D, so 3D, yes, you have B, C, maybe I write yes. 2D, you also have B, C. At a finite temperature, which is much larger than your trap frequency, 
you see the microscopic occupation of the uh, ground state in your two-dimensional harmonic oscillator. 1D, no. And that actually means that that's what it means. Of course, if you push it too low, yeah, because we know it's T0, yeah, everything, everybody, every particle should sit in the ground state. Yeah? But in this case, one decade, you have to put temperature of the order of le level space in your harmonic oscillator. Yeah? So in this sense, no. OK. Uh, so now let me now uh, a bit discuss what, we, what are the properties of this state, yeah? ground state. And then I discuss kind of excitations on top of it. Yeah, this is classical condensed matter analysis, ground state and excitations around. Yeah, and then we, and I show that this is not a superfluid state. Yeah. So um, what is the ground state? Of course, this is the state and all particle it's exactly the one where you have to write down the wave function, or at least try to write down the wave function, where all particle sits in the lowest energy state with P equals zero. And of course, I can write it in a kind of our second quantization form. That's my ground state. Energy is, of course, zero because particles have momentum zero, kinetic energy is zero. Huh? So uh, let me calculate the correlation function of one particle density matrix in this state. So let me calculate G of R, which is, let me define it like this. I kill the particle, it's many body system, so you can kill the particle first. Yeah? It's not a vacuum state. Yeah? Uh, I kill it at position zero, and uh, create it at position R so in other words what it measures it measures overlap when I between the two states psi at 0 G and psi at R G so if I make the overlap I have to conjugate this goes to psi dagger this goes to the to the left bracket to the bra yeah and this is exactly this overlap what I want to calculate so in other words I take something I made something here and I made something there and how do these things know each other yeah so this correlation function and then it's easy to calculate I just have to plug in there my decomposition for psi of r this is one of the volume square root of volume sum of all p, a p, e to the i over h bar p r. But now I have a ground state. That means, so first of all, I apply these things. Yeah? And then, of course, a p applying to the ground state is square root of n when p is exactly 0, n 0 when p is non-zero, because we don't have particles, yeah? And all the state with p non-zero. Yeah? So therefore, the same trick happens here, yeah? But I also have exponents, yeah? So net result is one of the volume, because I have two psi of one of the volume. No sums anymore, because p zero, yeah. And uh, moreover, because in this case, yeah, p equals zero, my exponent also disappears because p equals zero. Yeah. So I simply have m because square root of n squared. And you see, this is r independent So whatever I do, I do something here, I know there. This is what is called off-diagonal long-range order. Off-diagonal long-range order. Yeah. So 
uh, it's indeed the case. They're all particles sitting under the same wave function, single particle wave function, and therefore they know. No? If I do something here, they know it's there because it's the same wave function. No? Um, you can calculate the same story, the same things, at a different temperatures. No? And I just give you the results. Yeah, at large distances, which is of course the most interesting case to analyze finite T, where you don't have a, a state, but you have a density matrix. Yeah? You have a statistic. You're not a pure state, you're a mixed state described by some density matrix. So uh, I give you the answer. First of all, when T is less than TC, that means miracle zero. Yeah? I just... Uh, So this G of R would be then given, of course, there would be contribution of the condensate, N0, but now as a function of T divided by volume, or the concentration, yeah, plus, plus the integral dP over 2 pi H bar cube uh, e to the minus I over H bar PR e to the dP over T minus I. That's the answer. And if you analyze this integral for large R, as usual in the Fourier, we need small p. Small p mean I can expand it yeah, for this particular p. And then you will end up, when R goes to infinity, you get this uh, uh, n0 on t. This is concentration. Yeah, this is this one plus, and then you have um, um, 2 mt, that's denominator, and then you have integral dp over 2 pi h bar cube, e to the minus i over h bar pr, and then you have p squared. The rest I took here, no? p squared to 2 mt, take it here. Who knows what it is? You know the answer for this. You, you're not aware, maybe, that you know, but you know. If you know, have you had this electrostatic? Yeah. It's Coulomb. Yeah, because one over T squared is a Fourier of the Coulomb interaction. Yeah. So what you get from this part, 2mt, and I guess we need 4 pi and h bar squared because of this h bar. And then you have 1 over r, slowly decaying extra. Yeah? This is a constant which becomes lower, lower, and lower when you increase the t. But then this tail, one, one of our tails, starts more and more pronounced. Yeah? For non-zero t, for, for t larger than tc, but let's call of the order of tc, yeah? where mu is still small. In particular, we know that mu is non-zero, but modulus mu, in this case, let me consider still be very small, much smaller than Tc. Yeah? The answer for this G of R would be no condensate. This term is absent. Yeah? But then we have just an integral And now we have e to the epsilon p over t plus modulus mu over t minus 1. And I took these conditions that I can really expand, and I guess I want r goes very large, such that I need small p, such that both of the terms, this is small, uh, sorry, t. No? Okay, it doesn't matter. tc is also nice, no? because it's the t is even larger. No? This is small, this is then small, I can expand. Yeah, and then what I get, I will get 2mt integral dp over 2 pi h bar cube. And then I will have here, okay, e to the minus i over h bar pr divided by p squared plus uh, 2 m modulus mu. t is here, 2m is here, that's why I have here 2, 2 m and a model of me. You know also the answer. You cover screen column interaction. 
you cover. You cover potential. Huh? So this is 2mt 4 pi h bar squared 1 over r, but now with the exponent minus kappa r, where kappa is 1 over h bar square root of 2m modulus mu. Yeah. So you see, you now exponential cut. Yeah, depending on mu, and mu itself depends on temperature. Remember, T minus Tc squared. Yeah. The higher the temperature, the shorter the cutoff. Yeah. Because thermal fluctuation kills this long uh, order correlations in, in a system. Yeah. So this is the property. So indeed, we have below Tc, we have long range order. Yeah. So we have condensate. So to answer, let me now before we ask the question about the uh, about the uh, superfluidity, let me uh, simply very it's very simple to discuss ground state. We know what are the excitations. And that's clear in the ground state, all seeds with p equals zero, how to excite such system. Just take particle from p equals zero and move it to p non-zero. So p equals zero, one particle moves to p non-zero. Yeah. And the energy of these excitations, Ep, would be of course the energy of that particle. No, just one particle moves, but you can have many, but it's clear if you know what happens when you move one, you know what happens when you move any because they're non-interacting. It's just p squared over 2m. This is very important, p squared over 2m. Still single particle energy, yeah, because no interaction. What, what, what else would you expect? Yeah? And the wave functions, you can call it 1p. Yeah? It's uh, where you now have n minus 1 in a condensate, 0, and then somewhere at the place p is 1, and the rest is again 0. And if you ask me what, what's the state, how I can write it, it is 1 over square root of n minus 1 factorial. Then I have a 0 dagger to the power n minus 1 a p dagger acting on my vacuum sphere. And you can try to write down the coordinate wave function of the state, the wave function of the state. So now we know the excitation energy scales like p squared behaves like p squared, we have BEC, we have long range order. Question, does this system exhibit superfluidity? That means flow without dissipation. Yeah, the answer is no. And uh, I will explain you, Landau at some point gave a very simple, therefore very difficult beatable criterion yeah, of this superfluidity. And uh, uh, to understand this, it's very simple to understand so suppose you create a flow yeah, with moves with velocity v. What's the mechanism of slowing down? Mm? We are quantum physicists. We're not talking about friction, etc. Of course, if you have everything perfect, then everything perfect, but it's never perfect. Yeah? So that means that liquid interacting with the walls, you can create excitations in a system. Yeah? And if these excitations decrease the momentum of your flow that in the end, and it's possible to create such an excitation, yeah, eventually the flow will stop. That means superfluidity, yes or no, depends whether you can create excitations that slowing your flow down. And whether it's possible or not, depends whether by creating excitation you increase the energy of the system or decrease. If you increase yeah, excitations, you should. Yeah? But you will see. Then it's impossible. If it's decrease, yeah, strange, excitation, decrease the total energy. Yeah? But with the motion of these Galilean invariants, you will see how it works. Then these excitations will be created and in the end, the system will stop. Will be no flow. You can create, but it's fragile. Any kind of uh, imperfections will stop it. Yeah? So how does this looks like? Uh, so Landau criterion.
of superfluidity. This is very universal. Um, the difficulty is, of course, you have to check all excitations. Huh? But in our case, it's very simple because we know just a single particle excitations with the energy p squared over 2. To consider this, let me consider some I don't know, tube where I have my gas. Well, let's say t equals m. The, mo the best situation, whatever. Huh? And I have this gas moves with some velocity v along this canal. Yeah. Let me consider two reference frames. One I call K, which is your left frame. And K prime, this is a reference frame that moves together with the liquid. Where in K prime, the liquid is at rest. And there we know everything. Yeah, we know what's the ground state energy, what's the excitation energy. Now let me now consider the energy balance in my left frame before, before means no excitations is created, and after when I create some excitation. Yeah? So before. In K, yeah, I have a liquid at rest, so the energy is just the ground state energy, in our case simply zero. Yeah. Momentum of the liquid, because it's at rest, also zero. In K prime, sorry, 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 sorry. In K prime. Yeah. In K, what I have? Energy, maybe I should put primes is E prime plus one half M V squared. M is a total mass, V is a velocity, so it's just a kinetic energy of the moving liquid. Huh? Uh, <coughs> P, pro P is of course M times V. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That was before, yeah, we know. After. In K prime, I create excitation. Yeah? So my energy now, E prime, is E0, that was zero in our case, but in a more general case, not, plus, eps, E, uh, okay, I use big E, okay, then E, e so s yeah. this is a single particle excitation I create. Yeah? Momentum is, of course, the momentum of this excitation, yeah. Before is uh, before creation of excitation, then after creation of excitation. Before creation and after creation. Okay. So now what I have to look at, I have to translate this using my Galilean invariance, particularly energy. I'm not interested in momentum. Galilean transformation in the k-space, so in, uh, in, the, in the k frame. Yeah? The energy in the k frame would be then my, so to say, initial energy, it's E0 plus one half mv squared, and then comes the Galilean transformation of these extra pieces, which is epsilon p, sorry, ep, I probably should use, okay, ep plus P V. That's my Galilean addition when I transform from one system to another. So that means if I create excitation in the liquid in my left frame, delta E in my left frame is E P plus P V. So you see it's sort of not so obvious whether it's positive or negative. It was clearly positive here. Yes, so a liquid at rest at T0, no excitation is created, it's normal. No? But if you have moving and you create the excitation, so here it's not so obvious. Yeah? So possible to create an excitation if delta E less than zero. Then excitations will be created. Yeah? Everything what possible will definitely happen. 
And, and of course, the most favorable situation for this, when P is anti-parallel to V, yeah? somehow you start, yeah, so that's exactly which will slow down, yeah? And of course, in this case, for this case, we have delta E is simply EP minus PV. And now let me look, let me define this VC with a meaning critical velocity, which is the minimum over all possible P of EP divided by P. Yeah? So because I can write this very simple, P is positive, EP over P minus V. Yeah? If yeah? So if Vc is non-zero, then of course I see if I take my V less than Vc, this is always positive. So in this case, I'm not able to create an excitation, increase the energy even in a lab frame, independently of all these Galilean transformation, etc. Yeah. So excitations will not be created, and the flow will persist infinite time. But if it's zero, then you can have uh, delta E will be zero, less than zero for some P, and this would be created for any finite V there would be some momenta such that creation excitation with this momenta will decrease the energy in the lab frame, so therefore this will happen. But they are opposite to the flow of your, velo of your opposite to the velocity of your flow, so liquid will s or gas will slow down. For the ideal gas, VC ideal gas is minimum over all P of P divided by 2M, and this is clearly zero. So that means critical velocity is zero. There is no superfluid flow. Whatever you create it, there is always mechanism that uh, stop it. Yeah? So therefore, despite of this BC, Bose-Einstein condensation, long-range order, ideal gas does not is not superfluid. So what do we need? We need somehow, you see from here, yeah, we need to modify spectrum. And if you remember Thierry's lecture, if the spectrum at small p is linear, then exactly there would be non-zero Vc. Yeah? So in a sense, we are now going to non-ideal Bose gas with the hope, and of course you know that it happens, yeah? to modify the spectrum. Yeah? But at the same time, you see to modify from p squared to p, you cannot do it within the perturbation theory. Yeah? So it would be something more uh, non-trivial you have to do, and that was, so to say, done by Bogolubov. Yeah. But still, first, we have to put some ideas how to simplify the Hamiltonian, because I anyway, you don't solve the quartic interaction. You must have the right way, because the only way is perturbation theory around this Ideal gas, you can try, but you very easily see that it fails. Because you meet up divergent integrals, you don't know how to interpret. Yeah? So you have to m do some clever ideas, and to modify Hamiltonian, again, make it quadratic in some form. So uh, let's see how it works. Uh, what about this one? You have it. Okay, good. So then I erase. Okay, uh, there's a question? Yeah. Are there in a more general case, because here that's the only excitations we have. In a more general case, you have to look at all possible excitations. And for example, for helium-3, if you calculate this phonon 
because they have heli sorry helium four. Yeah. You have these phonon because it's interacting both the system. Low energy excitations are phonon, linear dispersion yeah, with a sound velocity. You get the critical velocity if you look only on them. Critical velocity would be just sound velocity, but it's much much less. Yes. But you are not in the moving frame. In the moving frame, you have a, a, a frozen liquid. <laughs> there is always there. There is always the preferable frame. There is always a preferable frame, yeah, of the vessel. You have to look relative. Then, in your where the liquid is at rest, you have the vessel is moving, but that's not what you want. Huh? There is always a preferable reference frame related to your tube where the the liquid is moving. So, therefore, this makes it asymmetric. Hmm? Okay, we discuss it afterwards. Okay, weakly interacting both gas. G, in some sense, small. We will see in which sense it's small. Yeah. Uh, but positive. Yeah, we need a repulsion. Attraction for bosons is a killer because they want to see it all together and in the Hamiltonian would be not bounded from below or at least would be proportional to n or whatever n squared. Yeah. So now the Hamiltonian is, let me write prime, is sum over p epsilon p minus mu a p dagger a p plus g over 2 v sum over um, p1 p2 and q and then we have a p1 plus q dagger a p2 minus q this is our scattering processes a p2 a p1 now let me look at the ground state. If I, this one, only this one, we know that all particles, all n particles, have p equals zero. Yeah. But now we switch on interaction. And immediately, you allow the processes where p equals zero collide with p equals zero, and it goes to P non zero plus minus P non zero. So two particles in the condensate collide and goes out. Of course, this increases the energy, but in quantum mechanics, this virtual process does matter. And it's exactly these virtual processes that kills the condensate in 1D. So there are so many of them that nothing left here. We hope that in 3D, the condensate will still survive. Because we think, okay, my this is uh, assumption we have to check afterwards. So in the end of all this story, we will have to check that number in the condensate yeah, and p equals zero remains microscopic. It will. Uh, 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 but this we really have to check. So the idea is, of course, so these processes, of course, present. So therefore, not in a ground state, not all the particles sits in a state with p equals zero. There are some fraction of particle that sits in p non-zero. This is called condensate depletion. At zero temperature, still you have depletion. Don't mix with the thermally excited particles. Yeah? But this fraction is small, so most of the particles sit in the condensate. Let's assume this. Yeah? Uh, so these processes do not dominate and don't destroy the condensate. That's assumption number one. Second, now we can use it. In which sense, as I told you, uh, if I have a condensate with microscopic occupation of the order n, microscopically large, then of course the matrix element 
of this creation operator, the matrix element, yeah, so in a state um, n, and here n plus 1, or whatever, n0, and if I have now destruction or annihilation operator, this is square root of n0 plus 1, this is square root of n0, this is exact value, but if n is very large, Yeah, if n0 is much larger than 1, yeah, you can neglect this one. Now, this is not approximate. This is n0. Mm. So the matrix element of the bosonic, this bosonic operator belonging to the, describing the mode, which is macroscopically occupied, uh, you can forget about the commutator. Yeah? A, A0 a zero dagger in this matrix element is zero. So operator that describes yeah, the zero mode becomes classical because it has very large matrix element. These are the dominant matrix element. It's not that the others are small. Yeah? If you look at the lower momentum, they're still largely populated. And you can also consider them as a classical field, this mean field description, gross Kitayev. But this is the most largest one. So therefore, what Bogolyubov did to simplify the Hamiltonian, so let's now consider the low energy sector of our Hamiltonian. Not the entire Hilbert space, but the corner which corresponds to low energy sector where this occupation of the zero mode, of this peak or zero mode, still the dominant one. Yeah? And if we consider only state in this sector, we can actually simplify the Hamiltonian selecting the largest term because these matrix elements are the for this operator are the largest matrix element because the Hamiltonian anyway, how you define it? Through its matrix elements. So in this corner of low energy state, the matrix element of A0 are the largest one. So therefore, the terms in the Hamiltonian which involves A0 are the largest one. So the idea of the Bogolyubov is just to, in this, classify the different terms according to the power n0. So means how often a0 or a0 decker appears there because the matrix element of these parts are the largest one. So you see, it's nothing to do with perturbation theory. It's sort of very strange classification of terms. Let me now erase this. And of course, when we see this operator A0 or A0 dagger, we just replace it with this matrix element square root of N0. It does matter, square root of N0, N0 plus 1, 1 we can neglect because N0 is really macroscopically large. So therefore, we can approximate it in this corner of the Hilbert space. Not everywhere, not just this. Not everywhere, but in this low energy sector. Okay, this term remains the same. Nothing to It's quadratic, so why should it? spoil it. Now we have g over 2v, and now we have, I have opened the bracket. Yeah. The dominant one is when all these momenta are zero. This is of course possible, satisfy momentum conservation. Yeah. I have this zero, so it means p1, p2, and q are zero. This is just a single term. It has four operators, a0, 2a dagger, and 2a. Yeah. So therefore, it has n0 squared. Yeah, that means four operators for this p equals zero, four p zero. Yeah. Next, you think it's three. Yeah, but it's of course, if three of this moment is zero, the fourth is also zero. So it's not the case. Yeah. So next term we have two. Yeah. Plus, and now we have a uh, two p equals zero operator. And here, uh, of course, I have to write the sum p non-zero, yeah, because two of the operators will be non-zero. And then, of course, there is this kind of obvious term, normal ones, yeah, where you have one a is a zero, and one a dagger is a zero. Yeah. So one of the a dagger has zero momentum, and one of the a has zero momentum. 
But clear, we have two a dagger and two a. There are four possibilities. So we have four. And it's easy to check that the other operator, after some renaming the indexes, has the form ap dagger ap. Because you, you have to anyway conserve the momentum. And if you kill the momentum p, you have to create momentum p. Yeah? You, ca you can very easily check. Yeah, I don't want to spend time because yeah, we, we actually started seven minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so there, yeah. Now comes the more less obvious part, which actually makes the, the job. Ah, yes. I should put it here. Yeah, because it's square root of n0 square. Sorry, thank you. And now comes two non-obvious terms, which actually make the job. Yeah? Where I have either two a dagger corresponding to p equals 0 or two a. Yeah? There is no other option. Yeah? yeah, I have to write it. Yeah? So when this two a0, that means I have two from the momentum conservation, uh, you can very easily see that p2 has to be equal to minus p1. Yeah, because you have, so you get, let, let me see which the order, because I don't want them to be confused with the what I do afterwards. Okay. Replace the two, you get A minus P A P. It's again, conserve the momentum. You remove two particles with total momentum zero. So you don't do anything with momentum, total momentum. And then of course, when I have these two, here then I have two a dagger, and you can very easily see that they have. You can write them in this form, and I write specially the, the such as this dagger. I write them in this form that you see that this term in the Hermitian conjugate of this one, but it's just renaming of p. You can always see, yeah? such as the Hamiltonian is Hermitian. Yeah? That's for two, but now of course we have plus, where now you have one p equals zero. But then you have three operators with non-zero momentum. And this is something that you don't want. Yeah? But clear, it would be proportional square root of n0. And compared to the terms you have, that would be very small. We neglect it. That's a cut in the Bogolubov approximation. So you keep these terms, but you neglect all the other ones. If you want to be more honest, in the end, when you diagonalize this one, we know what these things are doing. They just uh, will describe the process of, of interaction of this Bogolubov excitation. Yeah? Excitations of this Hamiltonian, they can scatter on each other. This is actually a term with no P0. Yeah? Or they can combine one decay in two or two merge in one. So this type of process, which you have when you have three operators. Uh, so this, let's stop at this part. This is, now you see you have a quadratic Hamiltonian and the order why you select these terms is occupation of your lowest energy state. Not the smallness of the perturbation, but occupation, which is very large occupation of your matrix element related to this very large occupation. So in principle, you have already quadratic Hamiltonian, but let me do some, another uh, manipulation yeah, so that we get a final thing. Because here you have N0, and in principle you don't know what N0 is. Yeah? So you have to calculate it in the end, so we can use, uh, but then you have the chemical potential, et cetera, et cetera, so you can do it. But the, the more simpler way is just now write down what is the number operator, which we know sum over all P, A, P dagger, A, P, and do the same decomposition. P0 and P non zero. We have P0, we have N0 plus sum over P non zero, AP dagger, AP. And now, of course, trick is I write N0 in the form of N, and this is all N. My particles number, no? So write N0 in the form N minus sum over P non zero. AP dagger AP, plug it in here and here, and keep only terms which are n squared and n. Because clear, yeah, I will have some 
so that means remove higher powers of operators larger than two. Yeah? And that's, I guess, the last formula. Okay. So uh, how does it work? Again, we have this kinetic energy. Ah, did I mute? Yes. So now what you have, you will have, of course, the first, the largest term will be this one, where you have n. Yeah? And this would be one half g n squared over v. That's exactly the mean field term that you have g times n per particle. Uh, because it's n times the concentration. Yeah. Then comes the terms um, from here. You get 2n, uh, sorry, g, 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 g over 2v. 2n sum over p non zero, ap dagger ap. Yeah, this is a minus, minus, minus. Yeah, this is I just take a s square, n squared minus two n times this one plus the sum squared. But sum squared contains four power. I neglect. Yeah. And now I have it there. Plus n n the leading term. Then I have sum over p non-zero. I have. 4 AP dagger AP plus A minus P A P plus AP dagger A minus P plus quartic which I neglect because they don't have, have N. If I neglect the cubic term here which is square root of N I has to I have to neglect the terms which has no N. Yeah? So if you look here and here, so you can write down the uh, Hamiltonian in a, in a much simpler form. Yeah, you see minus two. So yeah, 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 yeah. It's exactly. So this and this, n is here. Why? I take a square n squared minus 2 cross product where the 4 comes from. And now you see I have the term um, uh, AP dag AP exactly as here. Yeah? So let me combine all these three terms together and because you see I have here n, I have here v and if I remember that n over v is just my concentration n I can write down this term as a sum over p non-zero. It's all will be sum over p non-zero, like here. So this term would give me epsilon, uh, actually y, ah. I did sort of mixture of two canonical and grand canonical ensemble. Yeah? Because I fix my n I shouldn't have mu. I fix my n using these things. So when I do this, I don't need mu, actually. Yeah. Sorry. Because I fix my n. And use this to express n0 through this sum. Sorry. Oh, because it's uh, epsilon p. It's p squared. It's anyway not there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's zero. It's zero. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I'm, yeah. So epsilon p plus gn, yeah, because they have here in total 2n, yeah, half cancelled. Oh, sorry, half cancelled. n over v is, n big over v is small n, and I have this gn. Then I have AP dagger AP. And then have this, I have these anomalous terms plus G over 2V. No, G, uh, G, again, I have the same N over V, GN over 2. Yeah? 
a bit uh, one half gm looks nicer and then i have the bracket there i have a minus p a p plus a p dagger a minus p dagger so that's my Bogolubov homeopathy. So you see it contains normal terms, yeah, which preserve the particles number, but it contains anomalous term that does not. Yeah? Well it's of course no surprise because we are not considering here macroscopically occupied level P equals zero, which serves like a buff where two particles can go in or go out following these scattering processes that we discussed before. So it's only these scattering processes are actually taken into account. Yeah? So particles with P equals zero collide and go to P minus P or vice versa. All the rest is ignored because these processes has the largest matrix element due to macroscopic occupations of the state P zero. Yeah? The other process we can took as a kind of when we when we diagonalize this Hamiltonian tomorrow morning, so please sleep well, yeah? don't drink too much beer, yeah? and uh, we will see what will be the properties. Okay. Okay. So thank you for your attention, and yeah, we finish questions. Now. No, 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 no. Plus because I have here four uh, and minus two. Mm -hmm. So now I want to